He had a beautiful room. And then the radio shack was just behind, <coughs> behind his quarters. And back aft, there was the, of course, there was the, the galley, the crew's quarters, and, uh, and uh, uh, the engineers. And all, all of their quarters were, were lined in exactly the same way. Now, our, 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 armament, our armament consisted of uh, a three inch 50 up forward in a gun tub. Uh, on the bridge, there was, on, on each corner of the bridge, there was twin 20 millimeters. On, on the after deck house, there was twin 40s, a five inch 50 in a, in a gun tub at the, on the stern. Now, <laughs> the cooks, they often, they often, uh, often uh, worried about where we're going to fire that thing back there because every time they fired that, the galley was a mess. So they told the armed guard officer, don't ever fire that thing in practice until after lunch. <laughs> Before there's no lunch. But the pipes would come down and, you know, the soot all over everything. But, but uh, of course, the, you got the message and it never happened like that. Oh, we ate beautifully on that. I'm just coming to that. You want to lick your chops for a minute? I'll tell you about a guy and what he has for breakfast every day. You won't believe it. But uh, the food, we had fresh milk, fresh eggs, uh, fresh meat. We had just about, we, we had a menu. Now, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of guys I've talked to in the Armed Guard uh, have told me that they had a menu too. It was written on a green board or a blackboard or posted up on a bulletin board. But ours was a printed menu every morning. Every day we had a printed menu. <laughs> you could order anything you wanted on that menu. And that included, that included uh, a breakfast that was out of this world. So, uh, the, uh, we had a, a quartermaster now. There's three kinds of quartermasters in the service. Quartermaster Naval, which I was the last two years of my tenure, uh, I had to change, my, the Navy changed its rating system, and I became a Quartermaster Citizen, and then I became a Quartermaster, but still a Citizen, however that was. They had a terrible time keeping people in the service after the war, so everybody had to, had to know their job and a related job, or lose a strike. That was in 1946-47. Mm. Then in 1948, they took all the they took the right arm rates, which were quartermaster, sailor, boatswain, mate, and what else? Gunners, Thomas Gunners, fire controlmen. Right. All those right arm rates went to the left arm, and there were no more mm -hmm. right arm rates. And then we didn't have to defend ourselves on that one. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. They, what, the left arm rates? Right. Yep, deck ratings, you're right. And uh, so, this guy, let me tell you how he had, <coughs> what he had for breakfast. Cakes and two easy over eggs stacked in this manner. Jeez. <laughs> 
butter. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's up there. Uh, uh, right on top of there. And the coup de gras. Yeah. Maple syrup. <laughs> <laughs> Call a signalman. What are, those, waivers, right? what are they called? What's those things in your hand? Steve call them flags. Huh? Call them flags. Right. <laughs> but anyway, we, 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 we were called a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> but not late for breakfast. Now, that's just about, well, when we are on our West African coast, our West African run. Uh, before I get before I get to two two seventeen, uh, a West African run. Uh, like I said, we were on it for nine. We were on it for nine months. Back to Curacao and Aruba for our fuel for our fuel and, and uh, down uh, down the west. We we usually we usually hit three or four three or four of those West African ports there, and then back back and back and forth. But while we were over there, the first or second trip over there. Things started to take shape on board that the captain had no control of, or if he did, he didn't care all that much. What he wanted was a happy crew, and he had it. We had a chimpanzee, we had a baboon, we had a monkey, a one-eyed monkey, Sa Sally, she became our pet. She was the only one of those three animals that had full run of the ship. She loved bananas. I don't know what else she ate or what the cooks served her, but she loved bananas. We never found where she slept. We never found any of her dirt. We never found any banana skins. And she was a real pet of everyone on the ship. The other two animals were kept in cages on the stern. Now, these were very young animals when we got them. Uh, so, And we had birds of every color, feather, and song. Oh, we were the noisiest ship on the run. <laughs> And we had bananas, hands of bananas hanging all over the ship. We had flowers, we had coconuts, we had nuts, we had just about everything you could want. So we're in Lagos one time, and the captain is standing in the gangway. And he has sort of this, sort of this frown on his face. I said, what's up, Skipper? I said, you look troubled. He said, I am. I said, what's the problem? He said, I'm thinking of narrowing this gangway about two feet. I said, why? He said, if I don't, tomorrow morning there's going to be an elephant on this thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, he had a tremendous sense of humor. He, was, he called me Shorty. I love, I love give, taking over the watch of the quartermaster. Oh, get back to the quartermaster. Quartermaster uh, in the Navy on a naval ship is a navigator. They mostly work with navigation. Quartermaster in the Army is a a procurement officer, and they give things away. A quartermaster on board on, on board a, a merchant ship steers the ship. <coughs> so, uh, so he had he had other duties, of course, but his, his main duty was steering the ship. And I love to steer the Colorado. 
And the, and the Colorado had one of these, you ever see one of these big ornate, ornate wheel ships, real beautiful big wooden ornate this things? So, well, this thing was about as big as I am, five feet. Imagine me trying to see the binnacle staring at me. <laughs> Impossible. I could hardly see through the spokes, let alone see the binnacle. So he had the carpenter build a box. Much like that. And I stood on that to steer it. And he came up, and the captain came up one night, and he said, Shorty, he says, there's only one lock in this ocean, and I think you're going to hit it. <laughs> he always called me Shorty. Well, he was a tremendous personality. Anyway, uh, it came time for us to come home, and we had to uh, we had to get rid of the animals and the birds and what have you. Sally, we we couldn't put her ashore. We couldn't put her ashore because she was a pet. We knew that if we put her ashore and left her loose in the jungle like the others, that she wouldn't last the day. So we were pulling into Bathurst that afternoon, and there was there's a there's an army an army uh, 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 encampment there. U.S. Army encampment, and Staff Sergeant took her, so we know she got a good one. But anyway, we were, we were called home, and that was the end of that voyage. It was a tremendous, it was a tremendous experience. And uh, I, I, I don't know how many other armed guardsmen, and I know there are a bunch of them in here tonight because there are some from my unit up, up in Colsington here. I don't know how many of them have ever had that kind of experience aboard ship, but, but, uh, that was my experience, and it was uh, it was a, a tremendous experience. Did you use TBS? Yes, yes, we did. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah, yes. Between ships. Yeah, that was a very well. Let me explain it to those who don't know. What, what's the that? The talk between Point ships. Yeah, it was uh, no one else could. Get, that was the only way you could communicate with them at night. There was another way you could communicate with them at night too, but it was. I don't know. I don't think I've ever used it. I've tried to use it more than once. If you weren't good with a rifle, you, were, you weren't good. If you had a rifle-like thing that had a barrel on it about that long, an opening about that big, and a light back here at the back where the trigger was, you could send a flashing light message at night, but it had to be next to you on either side or forward or back. And really, because you had to aim directly at the person you were sending to, and only he could see that light. And uh, it had a trigger on it that also gave you flashing light. <coughs> now let's see what we can do with, with some flashing light on. <coughs> you might see that I have, I have jur jury rigged a few things, and I don't think any jury would admit doing it. <laughs> but I ended up, I couldn't find a flashing light, so. I had a jury rig one. I have the, of course, I have the lights. The lights work on, on, on each side of the arm. I don't know if I was doing that, but I might as well put lights on there, too. And that makes it sort of authentic. But uh, I jury rig this up here. It's a, it's a stoplight bulb with the filaments wired together, making a bright light. And while I was rehearsing with this, with this thing, I was starting to see things in front of my eyes that weren't there, and I figured that's too bright. So I down a basin and looked around for something I could use. That's the lid off of the red, of the red uh, spray can. So uh, anyway, let's, let's see what we got. Okay, Don. If there is honor or integrity. Yes. Uh -oh. Serving in our nation's armed 
proudly carry those cool proudly Our nation's banner. Our nation's banner into those battles. Remember? Remember and proudly so. Remember and proudly. take long. It took me about three or four days to come up to speed on both of these things, but uh, you don't forget. It's like riding a bicycle, right? You never forget. Now, we were, of course, we were sent home, and I was, and I was assigned to a, to a freighter, and I was on there until I got rid of the guns and dumped the ammo over. And uh, they were taking the gun. The, the, the Navy crew had to stay on board these, these merchant ships until the guns were removed. So everything that belonged to the Navy was taken off them. Okay. John, I think uh, because of the hour, I think we'll. Uh, I want to go to the. I want to go to the last, the last signal because I have about. I have about. If you'll stick with me for another 12, 12 minutes, fifteen minutes. I want to tell you about a convoy that was the worst disaster, one of the worst disaster, the worst disastrous convoy in World War II, and uh, that I think bears bears sharing. So let's go to the past.
are the voices that need to be heard. Especially by our children and grandchildren. <coughs> Especially by our children <coughs> and grandchildren. So that they learn the lessons. can teach history. We <coughs> can teach history as it has never been taught. As it has never been taught. And that can be true statement. I think that there are, there are times where a lot of us, depending on the trauma we went through <coughs> and the action we went through, was hard to talk about and still hard to talk about. But I think those of us that can should, because there are so many people who are just now learning what the armed guard was all about. Ask someone what was the armed guard, and they think it was somebody marching up and down, or marching up and down, trying to build a rifle or something. Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you about one convoy that. Bear with me for a moment or two. Uh, one convoy that was the most disastrous convoy to ever be formed. And there was two, in fact, but one in particular. Both of them were. Both of them were condemned to fail, were condemned to destruction, even before they were formed to sail. Mm. By Sir Winston Churchill and the British Admiralty. British Admiral Dudley Pound, Central American Admiral King, <coughs> the Russian convoy is fast becoming a millstone around our necks. His counterpart, Admiral Hamilton, ha Admiral Hamilton, said, the Russian convoy always has been and always will be an unsound operation of war. Both of these men were prophets in their own time. And I'll tell you why. Now, PQ-16 and PQ-17 was formed in Reykjavik, Iceland. Sail out of sail out of Reykjavik to the north. Sail out of Reykjavik, Reykjavik to the northern ports of the Mass and Archangel. Up here. Now, uh, Iceland is here. They were formed here on this coast of Iceland, the southwest coast of Iceland, and they sailed north. Most of the most of the. Uh, most of the uh, escorts that they had were British escorts, and the uh, first the, 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 the commodore of the convoy sailed on a cruiser on, an, on, on what was an American cruiser at that time. There were three American ships in this one 
escorts. But first, PQ-16 was ordered to sail by Sir Winston Churchill, and he said this, this convoy should sail if only half gets through. There were 35 ships in that convoy, most of them American. He was right, 14, 14 got to Murmansk. The rest were completely destroyed by the, by the German Navy, by the Air Force, out of, out of Western Norway, which was out of Trondheim and other areas along Norway's coast up in here. And uh, then he said about, now, there was a, uh, a real canaria about sinking the turpits, the German battle wagon. Yeah, they could never catch the turpits of the shard horse out at sea. Because Hitler, Hitler would never send his big ships out in the ocean, out of any ocean, that held an aircraft carrier of any air of any allied nation. He was he was he was so afraid of aircraft carriers that he never challenged them because he felt that if he did he'd come out he'd always come out a loser. So therefore, these ships stayed right in port. They stayed right where they are. They never did come out. They sent PQ-17 was formed out of formed in Iceland. Another 35 ship convoy was formed here, uh, and it, believe it or not, it was formed as bait for the turpits. They figured if they sent they sent this convoy out, this valuable convoy out, the turpits would come out and they'd nail her. She didn't come out. They got where she was. As I show on that map over there, uh, the British sunk her at her dock in Tomtown, nowhere. She never did come out. But uh, what happened was this 35 ship convoy took off, uh, took off uh, uh, out of Norway. They sailed north, and when they sailed north, they sailed north up here around Spitzenberg Island, which isn't on here. It's only a small here. It would be up about here. Now, that, they go up around here and down here in the, into uh, Bromansk and Archangel, which was, which was in here and in here. Anyway, uh, that would be when, yeah. when, 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 when uh, winter ice would, would start, they'd have to sail further south. And when they, fed, when they sailed south, that's when they, got, that's when they really got racked up by the Germans. But they not only had to put up with, with, with submarines and planes and whatever they threw at them, they had to put up with monstrous seas that were, that were pure hell, pure ice. The ice in storms that, that blew ice onto their, onto their superstructure and added tons of weight that could easily topple, topple a ship or sink her. So they not only had to fight the enemy, they had to fight the natural enemy too. They had to steam the ice off, they had to hack it off, they had to get it off the ship any way they could so they could continue sailing. Well, this convoy, PQ-17, was 35 ships, most of them American. And, uh, and, th and when, they got, when they got up north here, the British, the British Admiralty sent a message, sent a most urgent secret message to the convoy of the convoy, which happened to be uh, Admiral Hamilton. He was on, excuse me, he was on, he was on a, a, a cruiser that they suspected a large German naval force was sailing north to destroy the convoy. Well, of course, that wasn't, the, that wasn't the case at all. They, they stayed right where they were. There was, no, there was nobody coming out after PQ-17 at that point. Well, they panicked at the Admiralty, and they sent another message to Admiral Hamilton that the convoy should scatter and the escort should be removed. Now, uh, now that, <laughs> Admiral Hamilton couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe that this, that this valuable convoy would be put into, 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 into jeopardy. Now, well, this is what the escort consisted of. The naval escort consisted of three battleships, three, three heavy cruisers, 22 destroyers, and numerous other escorting ships. 
So they ordered, they ordered, they ordered the, the escorts withdrawn and the convoy to scatter to the four winds, leaving them, leaving them to their own fate. Now, no one could believe this. The destroyer, the destroyer commander couldn't believe it. He hung around for an hour dilly-dallying, and he just, he, he, uh, he, uh, Actually, the destroyers were supposed to stay there, but they decided to go and the rest of them went home. They might have too. So all the escort took off and left. Admiral, Admiral Hampton couldn't believe it, couldn't believe it. And he didn't order the, scat the, the, uh, the scattering orders until, until an hour and a half, two hours after they had been delivered. He figured, well, he had no choice. So he ordered the ships to scatter to the four winds, and they were left at their own fate. Germans couldn't, be, couldn't believe this was happening. It was like being left in a candy store. So naturally, they brought out everything they could bring out, and they went after the convoy. Now, this is what happened. The convoy was attacked. I mean, it was attacked by the German Fifth Air Force. It was attacked by. It was attacked by. Uh, 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 220 planes, uh, 14 submarines, and other naval, other naval service craft. Each ship was out there on its own. Now, the, this is what happened, and then we're finished. This was the hellish nightmare that went on day and night for endless days. The German 5th Air Force, consisting of 103 twin-engine twin junkers, 88s, 15 Hankel torpedo bombers, 30 Junkers, 87s, dive bombers, and 74 reconnaissance aircraft, plus a variety of other aircraft, totally 264 attempted to attack the ships of PQ-17. On their very first attack, they were prevented from dropping one bomb, firing one torpedo, or making a single strafing run by the courageous efforts of the doomed armed guard gunners of this doomed convoy. One ship, the Troubadour, fought by firing the guns in the tanks they carried on deck. Mm. The crew of the Troubadour in New York harbor mutiny. They destroyed the guns. They destroyed the they destroyed the munitions. The munitions. The the port director ordered the ordered the uh, uh, armed guard officer and his men to take them in. They locked them up in the they locked them up in the peak tanks up front, and that's where they were when they, until they got to Iceland. They mutinied again. They got locked up in the same peak tanks. No guns, no ammunition. They had to fight with whatever they had. So the captain ordered instruction be given to the crew to fire these tanks, these guns from these two tanks they carried on board. Hmm. Now that ship did get to Murmansk, and it got back to and it got back, talk about being snake bit, got back to Iceland safely. But anyway, to go on, uh, for eight to seven, the armed guard gunners of this doomed convoy, one ship the two were fought by firing guns from the tanks they carried on their decks. So much flak was thrown aloft that no German aircraft could penetrate it. If all this wasn't enough, a few days into this carnage, 11 U-boats joined in the attack. Alone and helpless, individual ships fought against overwhelming odds. Here is the result. 23 of 35 ships sunk. Nine ships and their crews lost. 14 ships with a total loss of 119 crewmen. Hard work total, totaling $700 million in total value lost, enough to equip an army of 50,000, including 297 aircraft, 594 tanks, 4,246 lorries and gun carriers, and 156,000 tons of cargo. Remember the prophecies of Hamilton and Crown? They came through. So Winston Churchill, after this was over, he was just as aghast as Stalin was that such a valuable convoy would be put to would be put to would be put to task and, and destroyed. Stalin was so mad that he, he recalled his he recalled his, uh, his chief of staff from London, and he really put up some smoke between London and, uh, and the United States. He wanted, he wanted some answers. But looking back on it, Winston Churchill said, we're 
was horrendously shocked by the terrible losses, and, and he, admitted, he admitted his error. He said the, de the decision to scatter was precipitate, and the destroyer withdrawal was, a cert was certainly a mistake. All risks should have been taken in defense of this, of the merchant ships. And isn't that the truth? And on that sad note, I end it, and I thank you very much. some questions uh, a little bit later, but uh, on the same subject, there's a book I checked out of the library before it was closed that I've read. It's on the same subject, if you can remember what we were talking about, Convoys. This is Convoy by Martin Middlebrook, a 1976 publication, and it talks about another uh,